Liberty in Texas that has been requested by the Human Rights Clinic at the University of Texas School of Law, Texas Civil Rights Project. Uh, the delegation um, from the petitioners is present and the uh, delegation uh, from the government. Uh, I welcome uh, uh, both delegations. Um, with me are uh, Commissioner um, Rosa Maria Ortiz, who is the Rapporteur of the Rights of the Child at the Commission, and the uh, Adjunct uh, Secretary Elizabeth Avimarchet. My name is uh, Felipe Gonzalez. I'm the Country Rapporteur for the United States. I'm going to give the floor to the petitioners for 20 minutes and then to the government for the same uh, time. Good morning, distinguished commissioners and members of the U.S. delegation. We're grateful to have the opportunity to speak in front of you today on the serious issue of extreme heat in Texas prisons. My name is Cameron Naw. I'm a member of the Human Rights Clinic at the University of Texas School of Law. With me today is Christopher Lamori, Maxwell Sokol, Kyle Shen, Jenna Almalawi, and the director of the clinic, Ariel Dulitsky. We're joined by Brian McGivern from the Texas Civil Rights Project. In April of this year, the clinic published a report detailing the human rights violations occurring as a result of extreme heat in Texas prisons. Our presentation today will highlight those issues along with new information we've received through research and interviews. We'd first like to play you a short video illustrating Texas's complete failure to protect inmates' human rights told from the point of view of the inmates themselves. The clinic and Brian will then speak. Thank you. Well, the buildings are built, okay? So you have a glass wall, nothing but glass panes, okay? The effects of that heat shining into the window, right? It, it's like the locked car effect. Car parked out in the sun with the windows rolled up. The officer come through one day, or I remember, with a laser thermometer, and he hit the front of my cell. It wasn't nothing but 145 in the afternoon, man. It was 137 degrees. It usually cools off about 11 at night. So you probably get a good two or three hours of sleep. And when the sun comes up, and, and being in that type of heat, it causes a lot of friction too. Yeah. It increases fights, violence, clashes with guards because everybody got a bad attitude because it's hot. When you combine a bunch of men in the showers with the water at 105 degrees, it's hot in there. They, they run 200 naked men in there. And, 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 and once you get in and get a shower, you're, you're, you're sweating before you get back out. We usually wet a sheet, lay it on the floor. Use a strip out and uh, put our fan on us. It's pretty much the only way to stay cool. Otherwise, you're going to be feeling exhausted. Did they shut the water off? When did they do that? They shut that off uh, last week. We didn't have showers. We shut it down Monday. We didn't shower on weekend, Saturday. We just have to put a towel over the toilet, you know, and keep your cell and so we don't smell the stench. They, they, if you're lucky, they'll bring one cooler once a day. Yeah. Put it in that dorm, no supervising, issuance, any of that. If you're a weak and, and, and frail individual on, on a transfer unit, uh, trying to, that, that, hey, I want some water, man. Look, they're going to take your ass behind the wall over there and beat the shit out of you, man. You know what I'm saying? You know better. You don't even try. It's easy to become a victim in her. I've seen guys die from neglect. They just, they just, a uh, uh, couple of guys just in the past couple of months. They're not only doing this to prisoners, they're doing it to all the officers back there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? You got a, that one year alone had 92 uh, serious injuries of officers, heat related injuries. Have you ever seen the guards suffering or complaining from the heat? I've seen them pass out. Oh, wow. Uh, taken out in wheelchairs and you know, things like that. You know what? There was a time, there was a time long ago before I was ever a criminal at all. I was a respectable guy in society. I worked for cities and everybody else. Okay? Out of my ignorance, I had a, a natural bias for prison. You know, murderers, they're rageous, you know. They don't deserve air conditioning. Really. It's a different story when, you, when you're living back here. <laughs> Your mind and heart becomes humble where it wasn't before. I think that people need to be, have their eyes a little bit more open to how we're treated here. I mean, we've got over 150,000 inmates in Texas alone, right? And no one knows how the conditions are here. We're human beings too. Uh, we have families. Yeah, we made mistakes. We're here for committing a crime. Uh, but we're human beings too. And I wouldn't, would, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. That at times when the 
the temperatures are real high, it's not livable. It's, it's hard on us, you know, I mean, especially those that have medical issues. I feel for them, you know, and I just really hope that they get something in place, you know, you know to deal with the heat, you know, because who knows, you know, it might be my time next. We'd like to make you all aware of five facts as we go through our presentation. One, heat conditions in Texas prisons are unlivable. People are dying and suffering. Two, these heat conditions are entirely preventable. Three, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice is aware of the problem and is doing nothing. This problem has been going on for years. Four, measures employed by the TDCJ to relieve the heat are insufficient. Five, this is a national problem, though TDCJ's violations are especially egregious. So, what does it mean to say heat conditions in Texas prisons are unlivable? Esteemed commissioners, these people need relief. Since 2007, at least 14 inmates are now dead as a direct result of extreme heat in Texas prisons. The grave you see before you belongs to Albert Hinojosa. He was one of the 14 killed by extreme heat in TDCJ facilities. This is a grave that would not exist today if TDCJ provided livable prison conditions for its inmates. Many more inmate deaths go either unreported or misreported as non-heat related. Five of the 14 inmates who died spent less than a week in TDCJ custody before dying. Many of these inmates received, in effect, a death sentence for crimes like drunk driving and theft. All of the inmates whose body temperatures were measured at the time of death had body temperatures between 105 and 109 degrees Fahrenheit, 40.5 to 42.5 degrees Celsius. None of the facilities in which these inmates died were equipped with air conditioning for the general population. As of June 2014, TDCJ's inmate population numbered 150,900 individuals across 109 facilities, the vast majority of which have no air conditioning and insufficient ventilation. As you can see from TDCJ's own prison temperature log, during the summer months, TDCJ internal prison temperatures consistently exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32.2 degrees Celsius, and are often combined with humidity levels that can reach 100%. This, create heat, this creates heat indices, which is a measurement of how hot heat feels to the human body, of over 150 degrees Fahrenheit, 65.6 .6 degrees Celsius, which lasts for several hours at a time. According to this National Weather Service chart, this heat index is in the extreme danger zone for heat stroke with prolonged exposure. Even by 10.30 in the morning, the combination of heat and humidity in TDCJ facilities is already in the extreme danger zone. The temperatures reached in TDCJ facilities are literally off the chart. The TDCJ training manual itself states that the risk of heat stroke begins at only 91 degrees Fahrenheit, 32.8 degrees Celsius. This heat is something that affects even the healthiest of inmates. In interviews, they describe dizziness, fainting, and heat rash as a part of their daily experience in the summer. 24-year-old inmate Jesse Hanbuth told his wife Emily he's woken up vomiting because of the heat. He said he wanted to die, it felt so bad. Another inmate described TD TDCJ facilities as basically cooking the inmates. Inmates regularly skip meals because they can't bear the heat in the chow hall or because eating makes them feel sick because the heat in their cells is so bad. Certain medical illnesses can increase susceptibility to heat, and this includes such common afflictions as obesity, hypertension, diabetes, old age. Tens of thousands of prisoners in the TDCJ system are elderly. Furthermore, psychotropic medication used to treat mental illness also has the effect of increasing heat vulnerability. According to the TDCJ director, Brad Livingston, whose notable absence we today regret, 82% of TDCJ inmates have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Unbelievably, TDCJ does not specially monitor these inmates who are heat vulnerable. Further, the TDCJ does not even tell inmates that heat vulnerability is a side effect of their medication. If they know multiple inmates have reported skipping their prescribed medication because of the heat effects, this creates additional suffering for inmates. It also creates safety worries for guards. Inmates are not the only ones who suffer in the heat. TDCJ guards have filed at least 147 reports of heat illnesses in a single year, 
and prisoners cite instances of guards passing out or drenched with sweat as a regular occurrence. Guard suffering caused union officials representing Texas prison guards to publicly support lawsuits filed by families of prisoners who have died from heat in TDCJ facilities in both Texas and Louisiana. Families of inmates are also affected by this issue. This commission knows firsthand the pain and suffering that families face when their loved ones' human rights are violated. There are countless family members of TDCJ prisoners who are afraid for their loved, loved ones' lives and afraid to complain for fear of their loved one facing retaliation. This is their everyday reality. So are the extreme temperatures in TDC, TDCJ prisons preventable? Yes. Air conditioning would provide a blanket protection for inmates in a way that remedial measures simply cannot. Even Guantanamo Bay Detention Camp provides air conditioning to its prisoners. TDCJ knows this. They recently spent $750,000 on climate-controlled housing for pig farms while ignoring the human rights of its prisoners. Texas's failure to adopt maximum temperature standards is a clear contrast to other states with similarly excruciating temperatures. States such as Arkansas, Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma all have a maximum temperature standard of 78 degrees Fahrenheit, 25.6 degrees Celsius. Texas County jails have a maximum temperature standard of 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 29.4 degrees Celsius, echoing similar municipal standards in Tennessee, North Carolina, and Illinois. Mississippi and Louisiana have held that extreme temperatures in prison can constitute cruel and unusual punishment. The Texas Department of Criminal Justice is aware of the ongoing problem, but has insufficiently addressed it. The yearly American Correctional Association audit warns that deaths are likely occurring due to the extreme heat. The inmates we interviewed all stated that they had filed multiple formal and informal grievances with the TDCJ, but to no avail. In the rare case of a response, there was no investigation. TDCJ passed out an emergency notification to its staff earlier this year advising their employees to protect their pets from the extreme summer heat. They state that it is a common sense tips and besides the obvious and if their in pets are kept indoors to make sure they have access to air conditioning. The measures advised in the notification aren't employed on behalf of inmates. TDCJ released a memo this summer proposing remedial measures to address the heat risks. These measures included making water available at all times, allowing additional showers, and making available the purchase of small fans to inmates. Most of these measures are either not followed or not implemented correctly, and if they are followed, they are still inadequate to address the issue of extreme heat in an enclosed structure during a Texas summer. Remedial measures cannot protect inmates. TDCJ would say that it provides ice water, but it is provided in a wholly inadequate manner. Ice is provided only in the mornings and not replenished during the hottest hours of the day. One five-gallon cooler of ice water is given for a room with 140 to 150 inmates. Sometimes this ice is dirty and full of mosquitoes. Though the TDCJ provides fans, these fans must be purchased at $22.50. They are uh, one of the most expensive items on the commissary list. As a great relief measure, they allow inmates to wear shorts. Shorts they must also purchase. If 40 to 50% of the inmate population is indigent, how can these fans be deemed remedial? CDC studies have shown that the fans will not protect people from heat injury if temperatures exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit and humidity is exceeded 35%. As you can see on the chart, the readings of temperature and humidity within TDCJ facilities regularly exceed this ceiling. This measure is completely insufficient. One inmate described his fan as a heater. TDCJ provides communal fans in the day rooms where up to 200 inmates congregate, but these only serve to circulate hot air. They are supposed to provide extra showers, but no one is getting them. In some units, showers are only allowed three times a week. This is a national problem. Esteemed commissioners, while TDCJ facilities blatantly violate prisoners' human rights, this problem persists countrywide. Inmate deaths have also occurred as a result of extreme heat in Arizona, California, Florida, New York, and Michigan. These, condition, these conditions violate standards set both by the Commission and numerous other international bodies. The American Declaration states that no one shall be, jucted, shall be subjected to cruel, infamous, unusual punishment. 
All persons, even those deprived of their liberty, have the right to life and security of their person. Parallel language exists in the American Convention and in the principles and best practices on the protection of persons deprived of their liberty in the Americas. The conditions in TDCJ prisons also violate the UDHR, the ICCPR, and CAT. Particularly, these conditions violate the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners as approved by the UN Economic and Social Council. This commission has not set maximum temperature standards for prisons, but in three reports, and most recently in 2012, it has found that extreme temperatures can constitute, constitute inhumane treatment of prisoners. Multiple cases from the European Court of Human Rights echo this sentiment. The US State Department itself has identified poor ventilation and stifling heat as violating human rights standards in many countries around the world. Esteemed commissioners, my name is Brian McGivern, and I'm an attorney with the Texas Civil Rights Project. We're a nonprofit organization that has been litigating civil rights issues around Texas for 24 years. And in recent years, we've been heavily involved in litigation regarding this issue. Now, it's important not to look at it through too narrow a lens, through simply a snapshot. It's important to recognize that the uh, situation we're dealing with is a result not only of the cruelty of prison administrators, but also because of the cynicism of Texas state politics, which together have been allowed to flourish because of the indifference of the federal government. Now, TDCJ, the fact that its prisons are not air conditioned is not a fluke of history. It's not simply a matter of the agency being stuck with a bunch of old prisons. 91 of Texas's 109 prisons were built after 1980. 91. Now, that was a time frame in which air conditioning was put into every public building, certainly in the South. Uh, and that's acknowledged by the fact that the portions of the prison where the wardens work and where the, the wardens direct assistants work are air conditioned. Texas, the prison system made a conscious decision to deny that basic um, protection to inmates. Second, as you've heard here, this is not an unknown phenomenon and it's not a recent phenomenon. It's not an obscure phenomenon. Uh, deaths have been uh, documented since at least 1990. And in the course of this investigation, we found at least 14 since 2007. Moreover, inmates, uh, or rather prison administrators, wardens, and all the prisons across the state have been awash in prisoners' grievances, explaining to them the effect that the heat was having and pleading for help. And their response was not to try to fix the problem or address it. Their response was to deny the problem and to hide it, and as of this date, to fight it tooth and nail. And finally, perhaps most galling, it's not an irreparable problem. It's not as though Texas went and spent a billion dollars on prisons that don't have air conditioning and that it would have to spend a billion more to build a new set of prisons. That's not the case at all. The inmate living areas in these prisons have the ductwork necessary to install air conditioning. The only thing that they're lacking are the cooling units. So despite knowing and despite people dying and despite the fix being easy, TDCJ has chosen not to try to remedy the problem. It's simply tried to hide the problem and deny it. But it's not alone in this. The state governments also played a role. Um, the building spree didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened because from 1970 until today, our prison population has gone up more than 10 times. In 1970, it was 14,000. Today, it's over 150,000. And that's because the legislature, and more pointedly, individual legislators who've occupied it over time, have had a hunger for creating new felonies and for enhancing felonies to be tough on crime. But spending has not kept up with that increase. If you look at the late 80s and the amount of money we were spending then, if that money per inmate had kept up with inflation, then today Texas would be spending $26,000 a day on inmates. But we're not spending $26,000 a day, uh, excuse me, a year, $26,000 per inmate a year. Today we are spending $16,000 per inmate a year. Spending has not even remotely kept up. Now that leads to uh, problems in services across the board with the terrible results, sometimes horrifying results, of which this is just one of many. But the state is culpable for that situation. And finally, more pointedly, the federal government. I mean, it's no secret that across the South, um, states have not always had a great track record for civil rights. And that often the federal government has been instrumental in help forcing them to comply with those duties. 
for both civil rights and human rights. Texas and the Texas prison system were no different at one time. Starting in the late 70s through the late 90s, the federal government, the Department of Justice, were instrumental in uh, accomplishing a number of reforms. But then for a number of reasons in 2001 and 2002, it chose to withdraw from that role. And since then has cast a blind eye on really all of the issues occurring in the Texas prison system, including this one. But there's no reason why that, it has to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Um, and I would, I would encourage them personally to renew that role because they have the ability to help fix it. The only question is whether they will choose to do that. Um, and until they do, I regard them as being as culpable for the sweltering prisons in Texas as our Texas prison administrators. Commissioners, I repeat that relief is needed. Not only is TDCJ aware of the death and suffering of those in its care, it has, along with the state of Texas and the U.S. government, the means and the authority to implement changes that would relieve that suffering. Despite this, no one has taken responsibility for making these changes. So we ask the commission for three things. One, immediately express concern over the issue of extreme heat in Texas prisons and regret the absence of the Texas delegation from this hearing. Two, conduct investigations into TDCJ prison conditions during the summer months. And three, facilitate a meeting between the TDCJ, TCRP, and the Human Rights Clinic to discuss this issue in the presence of the State Department and the Department of Justice. Thank you. Thank the delegation of the petitioners, and now I give the floor to the government for 20 minutes. Thank you very much, distinguished commissioners, petitioners for this hearing, and secretary and colleagues. Again, my name is Michael Fitzpatrick, and I'm the deputy permanent representative of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. It is my pleasure to represent the United States today to hear the views from Pref Professor Delitsky and his colleagues on the prison conditions in the state of Texas. We thank you very much for the information you've just provided. To begin, I would like to reiterate that the United States takes very seriously the work of the Commission and makes every effort to ensure appropriate level of participation in hearings we are called to attend. In this case, as soon as we received the hearing request, we notified the appropriate Texas authorities and requested their participation in this hearing. We also reached out directly to the Texas Attorney General's Office to offer more background on the Commission and its mandate. However, the state of Texas, through a letter dated October 17th, declined that invitation and requested that the hearing today be canceled due to ongoing litigation on these matters. As you know, the state of Texas construed the commission's request as a hearing on a petition, unquote, under Article 64 of the commission's rules. As such, the state of Texas stated that the hearing should be canceled as being improper under the commission's own rules of procedure. Texas pressed that the admissibility of such a petition has not been established and the matters raised were currently under litigation in the United States. As such, since exhaustion of local remedies under Article 36 of the Commission's rules has not been established, Texas concluded that there is no basis to entertain a hearing on the petition at this time. While we understand that the Commission has since clarified that this session is not a hearing on a petition under its rules, the State of Texas still objects to it given that Professor Delitsky's organization has also appeared in ongoing litigation in U.S. In US courts over these very same issues. Thus, we are now unfortunately in a position where no one from the state of Texas is here today to, to discuss the substance of the petitioner's concerns. The Department of State informed, sorry, the Department of Justice informed us that it received a copy of the letter, press release, and report on extreme heat conditions in Texas prisons that the University of Texas Human Rights Cl Clinic sent to the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Texas. While the Department of Justice would be unable to comment on the pending litigation in Texas or on the merits of the underlying issues in those cases, we will be pleased to convey any information received today to DOJ. The Civil Rights Division has authority under the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, CREPA, to investigate and remedy unconstitutional conditions of confinement imposed by state or local governments pursuant to a pattern or practice of civil rights violations. For example, the Department of Justice filed a statement of interest and an amicus brief in a civil case challenging the, the extreme heat conditions at the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola as violations of the Eighth Amendment in the case Ball v. LeBlanc. 
Plaintiffs in that case are prisoners on Angola's death row, and the Department of Justice filed its amicus brief in support of the plaintiffs. While the state of Texas was unable to attend today, the De State Department is here to listen to the various presentations. I am here along with Jeff Kovar, Assistant Legal Advisor for Western Hemisphere Affairs, Jay Bischoff, Attorney Advisor in the Legal Advisor's Office of Human Rights and Refugees, and Rachel Owen with me from the U.S. Mission to the OAS. The State Department assures you that we will pass along all information provided today to the appropriate state and federal authorities. To conclude, I would like to state that we shared the information about possible lack of Texas participation today with Professor Delisky and his colleagues prior to this hearing today, and they have agreed to discuss ways to better engage with state authorities in the future. With this, we would defer our time to the petitioners. Thank you very much. Thanks to the government for its presentation. Um, I would like to, to start by doing a few reflections. Uh, first, to say that, uh, as it was said, this is uh, not a hearing on a specific case or group of cases, but a thematic one, um, as the government of the United States is well aware, the Commission uh, holds uh, many thematic hearings on, on different countries or even thematic he hearings without a, referring to a specific country. And uh, in, even in, uh, in, in thematic hearings, um, which was not the case here, but petitioners can raise as uh, examples the, some specific situations of individuals and that has occurred in the past in, on many thematic hearings as well. In the same way that the, that the government, the government of the United States, of any other government, can raise some other examples, some cases are examples for the Commission to get a whole picture about the situation um, without implying that it's a hearing about a case. Now, um, I think that the, the presentation um, and the report presented by the petitioners uh, describe a, a, a very, a, a situation that uh, is of uh, um, extreme concern, um, which doesn't mean that the Commission is endorsing the, the, the description made by the, by the petitioners at this point. We would need further uh, information on this matter. But uh, to be sure, it is a matter that uh, requires a, a serious approach on the part of, of, of the government. And um, in this regard, I want to ask the, the federal government um, what other um, initiatives it might take uh, in addition to joining or starting litigation as it was described in a Louisiana case um, uh, in, in monitoring and uh, preparing reports or, or doing, uh, taking some other actions uh, in this regard. Um, I'm asking this especially because uh, litigation usually uh, takes a long time to, to end. Uh, and uh, it would be important to see some kind of uh, response on the part of the of the U.S. as a whole, federal government, state of Texas, uh, on this matter. Um, the federal government, of course, is well aware that uh, it is the entire United States uh, um, comprising the the 50 states uh, that is. Um, um, whose situation is, uh, is uh, reviewed by the, by the Commission in general, uh, so that uh, it is very important the engagement of the federal government regarding situations like this one that has been presented here that uh, concern one specific state. Um, we have tried, I myself, the rapporteur in Brazil, for instance, which is, as you know, a federal government as well, and we have brought on a number of occasions uh, both federal authorities and local authorities to working meetings and to hearings uh, for discussing the situation. I know that the federal government has made an effort in this regard. It would be very important to, to try to, to have a participation of the state of Texas in this matter um, because otherwise it becomes quite difficult to, to move ahead as it has been the experience of the Commission regarding our countries as, uh, for our, our federal countries as well. So. In, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, specifically the, the question of uh, what are kind of initiative uh, can the, the federal government take in addition to litigation and if the petitioners want to 
add something on this regard, would we, it will be welcome. Commissioner Ortiz. Muchas gracias. Mis saludos a los peticionarios y a los representantes del Estado. Eh, tuve la oportunidad de visitar algunos centros de detención <coughs> en Estados Unidos y eh, el tema del calor era un, un tema recurrente. Eh, también eh, mi preocupación iba en relación a las celdas de aislamiento y su uso como un mecanismo de castigo o disciplina. Eh, me gustaría consultar con los peticionarios si el, en las celdas de aislamiento el calor se acentúa, es más o es igual, si hay alguna diferencia. Eh, me gustaría consultar con el gobierno federal si existe, como en otros países, mecanismos nacionales contra la tortura, como se están creando en varios países, son estrategias para justamente crear mecanismos independientes que ayudan a este tipo de situaciones, a superar este tipo de situaciones. Son organismos independientes. Eh, también quisiera saber si de las 14 muertes desde el año 2007, si hubo investigaciones, quizás son los peticionarios los que tengan esta información, eh, ¿Cuántos casos están siendo investigados y qué efectos han tenido esas investigaciones? Muchas gracias. Deputy Executive Secretary Elizabeth Oli Marchet. Just a question of follow up very briefly. Um, if there is time, it would be helpful to understand, um, to, to understand the integral situation. The kinds of litigation that have been brought, in which for, uh, with what kind of record, um, is a way of understanding the tendencies and the trends in the situation and in how domestic litigation may be responding or not. Um, it might be useful to understand that. An overview, not the details. Uh, we now give the floor to the petitioners. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your questions. Thank you very much to the government of the United States uh, for uh, the presentation. I will respond to some of the uh, questions and uh, my colleague uh, Brian will will complete with more details on on, on some of the uh, concrete uh, litigation and possibilities of the federal government to be involved. And let me start by, by mentioning Bangladesh, Gambia, Guinea, Jordan, Mauritius, Mozambique, Pakistan, Rwanda, Sao Tome, Senegal, Turkmenistan. Those are the countries that the State Department, our colleagues here, describe as violating the human rights of prisoners due to the extreme heat in those prisons. They did that in the last year human rights uh, report on the different countries of the world. The situation in these countries is exactly the same as the situation in Texas prison. What the State Department is telling other states is what is happening in our state, in our country, in Texas. And the State Department not only failed to convince the authorities of Texas to appear in this hearing, but also fail to convince the authorities of the Department of Justice to appear in front of this commission. No Texas representative, no representative from the Department of Justice. That's why we need the commission. The commission is the only one that is listening to us. And we really need you to do something to convince the State Department to convince the Department of Justice, uh, to convince the Texas authorities to deal with this matter. And we need to do it now. We cannot wait until next summer. We have information that this summer people died again in Texas prisons because the authorities of Texas refused to implement any of the recommendations that we made in April, and they are refusing to come and discuss in front of this independent body what are the measures that could be taken. And let me tell you a couple of things that the government, the federal government should do. The first thing that the government should do is ratify the optional protocol of the Convention Against Torture to create the national mechanism as Commissioner Ortiz mentioned. The second thing that the, the federal government should do is extend an open invitation to this commission to visit any place in the U.S. whenever the commission decides and be allowed to enter to all 
the centers of detention. I know that the commission had difficulties to enter uh, prisons in Texas, and that is very important. Why? Because federal and local authorities are refusing international oversight on prison conditions, and that's why we need the commission to intervene. And the other thing that the uh, government, the federal government, uh, could do is do more engagement with the authorities in Texas. It's not enough to send a letter when the commission convenes a hearing. What the State Department and the Department of Justice should do is work with the Texas authorities throughout the year to explain what the commission does, the importance of the commission, to reiterate that the commission's recommendations are binding. Of course, I told my colleagues that I'm ready to work with the State Department to convince the Texas authorities of this urgent matter, but I cannot do it because you are the authorities, I'm not. I'm just a simple professor in a public university in the South. So with those uh, general comments, my colleague uh, Brian will complete on the specific things of the uh, litigation and other measures that the federal government could take. Thank you. I'm gonna do my best to give you answers succinctly, and if there's anything you'd like more detail on, I'd be more than happy to do that later. Uh, regarding um, solitary confinement and whether or not it is air-conditioned or not, uh, you actually see both of those in the Texas prison system. For instance, one of the inmates that you saw in the video is in a, a prison called the Cofield Unit, where solitary confinement cells are not air-conditioned, which makes it especially bad in the heat because it makes you totally dependent on officers to bring water to you, it isolates you from the showers during the day, unlike some other units where you may have access to that. There are some units where solitary is air conditioned. Ironically, the prisoners on death row are all air conditioned. Um, in between, uh, it should be noted that there's this process called lockdown, which happens usually twice a year, usually at least once in the worst of the summer. When inmates who are living in cells who might otherwise be allowed to leave those cells during the day and go into common areas are locked down and not permitted to leave for sometimes as long as a week, which was a prominent feature in finding an Eighth Amendment violation in some prior litigation out of Mississippi. Um, but the, it's, it's a comparable problem. No, less access to water, no access to showers. Um, regarding investigation, um, it's interesting that you ask because they've been of two minds. Uh, the prison system doesn't provide medical care to inmates directly. Um, a different state agency is contracted to provide doctors to do that. And in the course of litigation, we found email exchanges where doctors and medical personnel on site have sent emails to high-level administrators in the prison system, uh, uh, alarming emails, emails saying this is a real problem. Um, people are really suffering. We need to do something. The doctors themselves were pleading that they do something. And as far as we can tell, those emails were ignored. And I can tell you they really tried hard to keep them from us, too. Um, the role of litigation, I think, may ultimately have to, it may ultimately be the tool that has to get this done. However, the attorneys with the Attorney General's Office for the state of Texas, which is defending the prison system, have told us they intend to delay our litigation at every point, which is not an ethical tactic, but it can be an effective tactic. They intend to oppose every motion. They intend to appeal every interlocutory appeal that they can. They plan to object at every point that they can object to stretch it out as long as they can which is not unlike what they did in the original class action litigation in the 70s, which meant the trial, it took six years to complete the litigation. Um, they pointedly told us that they do not want to have any trials during our state legislative session, which in Texas occurs for six months every two years. It's, pa it's scheduled to start in January. They were very uh, specific that their client did not want to have a trial during the legislative session. Now, why might that be? Um, it's the same reason I think they're not here today. I think I can summarize their argument for not being here today. It was obfusca obfuscation with a spurious excuse, and once they were educated about why it was spurious, they stubbornly held to it because they simply did not want to talk about it. They don't have a defense aside from silence. So I'd be happy to provide more detail at a future date if that would be helpful. It is, excuse me, all this litigation is federal litigation. Uh, the state courts don't provide adequate remedies, but the federal courts have that potential. 
thank you. And, and now, we, I, now I give the floor to the government. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, first, uh, let me just reiterate that um, the Department of State is here to, to listen to the uh, to the statements from the uh, University of Texas project. We're here to, to listen to the to the commission and to your questions, but we're not able to address facts or allegations. Um, that are made, and, and in fact, um, uh, Professor Ortiz asked a question about um, uh, um, some of the specific facts that have been raised, which, again, we're not we're not able to, to answer. Um, however, Mr. President, your question is one perhaps we can answer, um, which is, um, what is the U.S. government doing about this? And and I would point out that. Um, the U.S. government is fully involved in this. It's the federal courts, as, um, as our colleagues have just pointed out, that are engaged in this case. In this case, uh, our, our colleagues uh, across the room, together with other uh, plaintiffs and petitioners, have brought these very legal arguments and factual arguments to uh, the U.S. federal courts and, um, and have claimed um, uh, violations of U.S. law, including statutory law and, and constitutional law. And we would point out, uh, Mr. President, that this is precisely why, under your rules of procedure, um, the, um, the commission ordinarily would wait for local remedies to be exhausted, um, because um, the goal here is to have, um, uh, in, in all of our countries of the Organization of American States is to have domestic legal systems that provide rights and remedies. And uh, the Commission needs to give those systems an opportunity to um, uh, to resolve those cases uh, first. Um, and we would note that even many, even many of the arguments that have been made here today are arguments about the litigation. Um, what what emails have been gotten in discovery uh, uh, in the case? Um, what has the position of the state of Texas been? What is its litigation strategy? When, when you hear it pointed out in that way, it's, it becomes clearer why the state of Texas would not want to participate because they're already participating and they're participating in the federal courts. Uh, and um, we, would, we would note from the state of Texas that there are quite a number of cases that have been brought on these very matters, and um, we would respectfully point out that it's uh, it's appropriate for for these cases, these claims uh, to be to be heard in federal court, and for justice to take its course. Um, finally, um, you asked about broader Department of Justice authorities, um, um, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick pointed out that the Civil Rights Division does have authority under the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act to investigate and remedy unconstitutional conditions of confinement in state and local prisons pursuant to a pattern of practice of civil rights violations. They do that in a number of areas. The Department of Justice has appeared in a very similar case uh, in the state of Louisiana uh, and has appeared to support the arguments from the petitioners in that case. And, uh, but we're simply not able to comment on um, uh, what uh, decisions or roles uh, of the Department of Justice in this current litigation. I think we should allow this litigation to, um, to work itself out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I, I think that uh, in a way my question was rephrased somehow because uh, um, what I asked was not what the government, was, the government, the federal government was doing or is doing, but rather what else could do in addition to participate in the litigation. Um, now, in uh, in regard to the um, um, uh, lack of participation of the state of Texas, let me uh, reiterate that the commission uh, regrets that it's not here. Um, it is for the commission to decide 
uh, it, about its jurisdiction and not for for the states really. Uh, I mean the states in general, not the United States, but the, the states in general. And um, and it is important to consider that the Commission, in addition to uh, deciding on, a, on a specific cases, and it doesn't have this uh, as a case or a or a group of cases, it has monitoring power and can also also issue precautionary measures. There are a number of uh, uh, measures adopted by the Commission regarding prisons throughout the hemisphere, which don't have a case before. They don't have, a, there is no exception of, exception of domestic remedies and the Commission uh, has uh, issued precautionary measures on many countries in America regarding prisons. So uh, it's really a matter of monitoring and what the Commission is asking the government is trying to move ahead in this regard as well. Litigation is very complex at the domestic level, at the international level, and that's why the Commission would like to see some other avenues and uh, alternatives presented by the government in this regard. Um, because um, the state of, of, Tec of Texas uh, isn't present at the hearing, uh, it would be very important to make a follow-up to get further information on the part of the government, as well as from the petitioners in Britain, after this hearing. Um, the petitioners were asking the floor if you can be very brief, and okay. the government may have an opportunity to speak yeah. again. Uh, very brief, uh, because there are uh, some uh, legal and factual mistakes. The, the Human Rights Clinic of the University of Texas is not involved in any single litigation in Texas. We do not represent individual clients. It's a mistake that uh, the Attorney General Office uh, uh, made. So I, I want to be very clear that the Human Rights Clinic is not involved. Second, the litigation is only about some of the persons who die and a class action only for a group of inmates, not for the entire uh, population. So we are describing the, the, the general situation. And what we want to, to have the Inter-American Commission do is to look into the general structural situation of uh, the prison system in Texas. We don't want to litigate in front of the federal courts, neither in front of this commission, the situation of 150,000 people. We know that the commission has many, many cases and we don't want to bring here another 150,000 cases. We want a structural solutions. When the Department of Justice received the letters from the mothers of inmates complaining about the extreme heat, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division responded that they do not intervene in individual cases rather than the investigating, as my colleague said, the pattern of human rights violations. The DOJ so far have failed to use the tools that it has at its disposal. And that's what we want to, to, to have, is ask the commission, not only the follow-up uh, uh, of this uh, hearing in writing, we are more than glad uh, to provide the commission with all the information that the commission needs, but also we want the commission to facilitate the space so we can sit with the Department of Justice, the State Department, and the authorities in Texas to discuss this matter. And ideally, uh, we request the commission to convene a working group, me uh, a working meeting during the next period of session so the three parties can report back to the commission the progress made to prevent more deaths next summer. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Would like the would the government like to just uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I was a little bit confused about. I guess the panel includes members from the University of Texas and also from the Texas Civil Rights Project, which apparently are not related. But in any case, they seem to be appearing to hear together, and as such, they're in they're. Um, bringing to your attention matters that are already fully engaged by the federal courts in the United States. So um, that's the point that we were trying to make. We think you should give the federal courts an opportunity to, to address these cases. Thank you very much. Well, the Commission will follow up on this matter, and as I said before, we will uh, very much appreciate further information in Britain about the conditions. Thank you very much.